welcome to Decoding TV, covering the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. I am David Chen. And I'm Don Marshall. This episode, we're going to be discussing Season 1, Episode 4 of The Rings of Power, entitled The Great Wave. Uh, we are going to spoil everything through this week's episode, but we will not spoil anything from future weeks, and that includes anything on the next time on Preview or anything from the books. You can always find more episodes of this show uh, in podcast form at podcast.decodingtv.com or find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash decoding TV. Don Marshall, let's talk about episode four of season one of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, The Great Wave. We we'll start with overall thoughts. What do you think of this episode, Don? I think this was the best episode we've seen so far. Um, and that has been more or less true with every episode. There were a few moments in three I didn't like, but four really seemed like they're ramping it up. We got a bunch of amazing lore drops that me as a book reader just, is it a little fan servicey? Yeah, but I think it was handled in such a way that like, it was really used well. I liked the writing in this one, especially Elrond. We'll get to um, we'll get to him. There were a few moments that stood out to me that I wasn't crazy about that I think were a little too on the nose. I think you and I might be thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, yeah, overall, they're they're uh, on the right track here. It seems to me. I thought it was pretty good. Here's what I like about the show. Uh, when Game of Thrones was in its earlier days and skipping around to different plot lines, it often would feel perfunctory, like sometimes visiting one of these locations mm -hmm. in an episode. And I like that they are, rather than making sure we visit every single character, you know, there's sometimes they're skipping characters and being like, right. let's focus more on this character. And right. I think that's like a good tendency that they have. Like they're, yeah. They're, they, they're giving each of these storylines a little bit of room to breathe. Right? Yeah, because we, we didn't even see the Harfoots this episode. They were, exactly. they were, we didn't see, uh, what was it? Is it Elrond and Durin? I think we didn't, we didn't see any of Moria in week three. Correct, correct. I was like, yeah, no, we definitely saw them this week, though. But yeah, yes, yeah, no, uh, they, they, were, they were the highlight this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I would agree. I think the Elrond and Durin stuff is some of the more interesting material in the show uh, and, yeah. and continues to be a highlight. But I like that. I like kind of the pacing that they're kind of giving each of these uh, plot lines room to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, I I think the Aaron Deer stuff continues to be just impressive to me on a craft level. The romance is still pretty underdeveloped, but like there's usually like some amazing action sequence each week that involves yeah. Aaron Deer, and I'm I'm enjoying that. Uh, the Galadriel stuff. I like the ideas behind the Galadriel storyline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think the execution is still a little bit lacking in the sense that, um, to me, a lot of the Galadriel storyline still just feels like people doing things. People doing things because like the plot requires them to do things and, and not as much uh, motivated by actions or events that occurred. Um, and... So as a result, I'm kind of more mixed on on that storyline. Yeah, um, I'm 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 the same. I'm in the <laughs> I'm in the same boat as you. But using boat for the Galadriel storyline doesn't seem uh, nicely done. Nicely done. Well, you know, I try and keep yeah. my puns clever. So so there's a lot to like, and the show continues to be visually spectacular and interesting mm -hmm. to look at, no matter mm -hmm. what's going on. Um, but I think some plot lines I really am enjoying more than other plot lines. That's kind yeah, of weird. yeah. It's not like I'm uniformly enjoying them all equally. It's kind of can I, can I ask you a question though? Yeah, Just please. because because you were on the sort of Game of Thrones uh, train for so long, yeah. when when you look at the early seasons of Game of Thrones and the sort of the pacing and the storylines, how does that compare to something like this? Four I know we're only four episodes in, and Game of Thrones had more episodes per season, but like, how are you feeling with it? Well, I think that something that a lot of people have discussed is that the Rings of Power and Game of Thrones are just extremely different shows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the House of the Dragon, which is the current Game of Thrones spinoff that's on TV right now, uh, that world is a brutal, unforgiving world in which there is basically no such thing as pure good or pure evil, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in which you're operating under shades of gray and somebody who's doing something good tomorrow might be sleeping with their sister or relative <laughs> and and brutally torturing someone to death and whatever, you know, like that's that's on a weekly basis that kind of reveal yeah. uh, occurs. Yeah. Whereas Rings of Power is more like, hey, we're just, 
going to places, looking at beautiful things. And by the way, we're trying at some point in the future, we're going to take down evil. You know, that's kind of how I feel about rings. Of- so it's just like, it's, it's really different. And I, I love that we can get both of these shows on TV at the same time. Oh, you know, me that too. Me fantasy too. can be like, there's some people who are very, um, adversarial you know they're like there could only be one fantasy show to rule them all but we're, we're not like that we're like no, hey there's no. room for everyone yeah um so it's hard for me to compare the two of them because i think they're just such different shows fair i think also game of thrones season one was mostly just people sitting in rooms talking yeah because that's all that's all they had the budget for that's true for season that's one, true because right? didn't they um, correct me if i'm wrong didn't they cut out a major battle from season one because they ran out of money towards the end uh, I don't know if that exactly is right, but there's definitely been some battles in Game of Thrones seasons one and two that were like, I remember there's like a battle and you see the people show up and they're about to attack the town and then cut to the battles over. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, they probably didn't have money for that battle. Yeah. Um, or there was one character who is about to go into a battle, gets accidentally knocked up, conked on the head and wakes up and the battle's over. Like that happens, That's what right? I'm, yeah, that's what yeah, I'm yeah, thinking yeah. of. Yeah. So, so that's, that kind of stuff happens in, in, in Game of Thrones in the earlier days. Mm-hmm. Um, so budgetarily, it was very, very different as well. Um, I think that one of the things that Game of Thrones did pretty well um, that I think this show is doing a pretty decent job uh, as well as like having a moral center for the show, yeah. which was the Stark family, um, Ned Stark and the Starks. They were kind of the the good guys and mm-hmm. the people that you're rooting for. Um, and then one of them goes on to become a serial killer. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> House of the Dragon is more challenging in that regard. Like I think uh, we were talking on uh, Castle Kings, a decoding TV podcast uh, this past week that like, there is no like stark equivalent on that show uh and, but in rings of power i think it's galadriel right yeah uh, is like who you're meant to relate with one of the issues with the show i think is that galadriel has mostly had one emotion for most of the show so mm-hmm. far mm-hmm. which is determination yes uh and perseverance against all odds and fighting evil and uh i don't feel like that's terribly interesting so far right it might become more interesting as she learns challenging lessons and you know uh and needs to like adjust her approach to right. be more diplomatic and uh adjust her approach and, and kind of slowly transforms into the version of the character that we see in lord of the rings fellowship of the ring right like mm-hmm. um i'm interested in that journey but so far uh it hasn't been uh it hasn't been that sort of uh nuanced in my opinion do you know what i'm saying whereas totally like, fair totally whereas fair. i think with the uh, game of thrones and like the starks uh, they're immediately learning about how complicated <laughs> everything is you know yeah, yeah uh and there are some some of the starks are like you know we're gonna do the right thing no matter what and some of the starks are like wait like let's hold you mm. know and so there's that complexity there that i don't think is quite there with uh lord of the rings but it's a different show so let's talk about each of the plot lines in the rings of power episode four the Great Wave. We'll start with Numenor. This is the biggest kind of plot line that unfolds throughout the episode. We open the episode with Muriel holding a baby and talking about, I guess this is like a blessing ceremony of sorts that happens in Numenor, right? Yeah, it's it's not necessarily written about, but it's not uncommon in history for the, the noble peoples to sort of present their children almost in the same way. Like, you know, when the Pope visits somewhere and like someone holds out their baby, this is like the more refined version of that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, or... Baby baptisms or something like that. Yeah, that too. So she is holding a baby and everything seems to be going great. And all of a sudden, a massive flood sweeps into Numenor and destroys everything and kills everyone. Uh, Pretty good CG flood, I would say. Like really well done. Lots of detail in it. Uh, Muriel wakes up and she's like, oh, it was was a dream. Or was it? Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) Surprise, this has all been taking place inside the mind of a person inside of a mental facility. It's actually Moon Knight. I'm sorry. This show is actually Moon Knight. Spoiler <laughs> alert. So they, uh, we then cut to a scene of uh, the Numenorian that Halbrand beat the crap out of last episode. And he's telling everyone, hey, these elves are taking our jobs. Uh, um, yeah, this was this. OK, so I, I will say. One of the main sort of complaints from a lot of people um, early on was that this show was very woke when they were casting people of color and 
I want to make it very clear this is not that, but one of the other complaints was they were sort of lo- loping in everything together where woke was also like modern politics. Mm-hmm. And this particular part was uh, a little bit too on the nose for me. It was one of those scenes where I'm like, I see where you're going. But if I may, just some of the the Tolkien lore behind it was a little bit more of like, they're not necessarily scared of the elves. They just kind of want to have power and a good way to do that is to be immortal. So like one of the, one of the main cruxes of, of Tolkien's lore was, uh, you know, this sort of do doing what, doing what you can with the time that is given to you. And there's that quote in the, in the fellowship of the ring. Um, and the humans of Numenor, in the, in the books at least, uh, some of them start to side with like the, well, what if I had all the time in the world? And that was a very driving motivation that he doesn't go into a lot of depth with. But this felt a little, a little bit of so, so, sorry. A just to just to clarify, Don Marshall, are you saying that the humans kind of wanted to be? immortal and that like the, that jealousy was what drove some of the conflict is that right yeah yeah i i think they'll they'll probably touch on this later so i don't want to go into too much of like spoilery details because yeah. we may see this fleshed out a lot but one of the things that when you're reading the silmarillion and learning all of this sort of backstory stuff is a lot of the the rulers and the people of power in numenor way before all of this stuff is taking place during the show is like Oh man, yeah, we're we're humans, but those those elves, man, they got it good, right? They got those beautiful elven kingdoms, they live forever, their technology is great. I want that. Why can't we have that? Mm-hmm. And so they kind of get angry in this this uh this uh you know, this uh antagonistic behavior starts to pop up. There's a kind of entitlement that the humans yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way right. to put it. Yeah. Right. Um I don't know. It didn't bother me. So I think your your one of your issues is the elves are taking our jobs. So a sounds like it comes from a South Park episode, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but B, it's kind of a t- really on the w- nose way of drawing a comparison between elves versus humans and like immigrants, for instance, in modern yeah. day, right? Yeah. Uh, I actually didn't mind it too much because okay. I feel uh, because I feel like we don't. But but uh, wait till I finish the sentence. Because I feel like the show hasn't done a great job of explaining the conflict between humans and elves, mm-hmm. right? Um, my sense from the first episode was elves are an occupying force, but then like the Numenorians have a whole different reason to not like elves. It's mm-hmm. not like they're elves aren't occupying Numenor, so um, so they they need to figure out a way to introduce some conflict between humans and elves and like give that more. A nuance and more definition i think mm-hmm. uh and this is the way they chose and I, I was fine with it I, like if anything i wish there was more detail around the elf human conflict in the show yeah so and I'm, the fact I'm giving that they're them... taking your jobs is like okay i, I guess I, we're not really seeing evidence of that yet right mm-hmm. in the show um but i th- this numenorian really just doesn't like this one elf in the city yeah. like the fact that one elf is too much right yeah so, yeah and and it is it is really relevant and topical, you know. Oh, one hundred percent is, and and if that is the direction they they choose to go in, I think it could certainly be a a uh, an avenue to explore that could work. I just wasn't necessarily impressed with the fact that they chose that specifically. Um, mm-hmm. And I hope that if they do go that route, uh, they they do give it that nuance, like you said. Yeah, yeah. That the, they, the, I agree. Just saying they're taking our jobs is not sufficient to actually make a meaningful political statement. Right. Right. So right. We'll see. Which you know you can just lie and make up political lie is like that. That's the real mirror of the of the, the real world. It's right. Like, well, that yeah. Maybe maybe this this guy is the fake news of the you know oh, of the middle earth right he's, oh, he's like God. the elves are taking our job there's a caravan of elves coming to take our jobs basically is what he's saying <laughs> oh, so uh we meet uh, again farazon what mm-hmm. is farazon's position he's a chancellor of numenor right so yeah he's he's known now as the chancellor they call him chancellor farazon he's almost like uh i don't want to say vice president ish like because obviously Muriel is queen regent because they've asked to the queen. So he's just like probably the number two, I'd say. He's, he's the number probably... two. The queen is the number one. And yeah. then the king is the king, right? The, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the order of. And so uh, Farazon is the big guy with a beard. He comes in and he's like, drinks on me. Forget about the uh, immigrant elves, guys. Uh, everything's going to be fine, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We also meet Farazon's son, Kemen. Yes. Who 
flirts with Arar- a- Aarian. Yeah. And by the way, nice pronunciation. Uh, thank you. And by the way, uh, I think has some pretty good game. You know, she has that line where she's like, "I don't. I'm not gonna." hang out with strange men and he's like that's a really good idea like i'll let you know if i see any i'm like wow that was, was kind of smooth this guy is, uh, he's been in this situation before i think yeah, um yeah, anyway yeah. he so, will grow up to be a great politician indeed indeed so or, anything else you want to say about kind of this opening sequence before we get to the, the galadriel stuff uh, um yeah so i think it was a pretty good way to introduce uh the episode just the visually stunning um portion of the the huge dream sequence flood i thought that was really well done um i hope they do a little bit more with the numenor stuff and the sort of antagonistic behavior uh, i definitely wanted more of that i don't necessarily find myself caring about the the kemen aarian uh scenes they feel kind of like i uh, i want to see other stuff uh instead but like what they're showing me i'm like all right, I'll, 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 I'll let I'll see where this goes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, at first I was like, well, "Who is this annoying guy?" And then it's like, "Oh well, okay, he he seems like he kind of has some game, so maybe it'll be interesting <laughs> to watch." But I agree. I'm like, "Why we're introducing Don?" Of course, my Eeyore reaction is, "We're introducing new characters in Episode <laughs> Four. Like we we're at the halfway point at this point. We should really start tying up some of the uh, or start you know moving forward with uh, some of the characters that we've already met." Anyway. Galadriel. Yes. She comes back from the Hall of Lore mm-hmm. and she wants to take an army to the Southlands because she believes that Halbrand is the king of the South. I do want to say you made a prediction last week that he is not and that he's someone else. And mm-hmm. online, I've seen quite a bit of chatter about oh, yeah. who exactly Halbrand actually is. Uh, and so I was very uh, dismissive. Uh, hurtful, uh, Kurt, with you last week, <laughs> one could say, about your theory that Hallbrand was not the King of the South. And I'm just going to reel that back a little bit. I'm going to be right. like, I'm Thank a little you. more open to what Don Marshall might have to tell me about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so whatever the case, Galadriel is convinced he's King of the South. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I, I guess, like, do you have any non spoilery thoughts on who he might be at this point? So or, obviously, yeah. my comment sections have been flooded with who is the stranger? Who is Hal Brand? Is yes. he this? Is he that? Um, I have no proof for any of this. And here is what I think is going to happen in a sort mm-hmm. of like, in it, it kind of to maybe address some of your concerns, David, as well. I think they are making Galadriel this sort of hot-headed, um, sort of non, not necessarily non-nuanced, because I think there's some nuance to her performance, but she's been sort of, she hasn't really learned any lessons along the way. Mm. I think the lesson we are going to learn with Galadriel is going to come as a huge shock, and I don't know if it's going to be the end of season one or like, maybe it's gotta be it's gotta be season one it's It's, gotta be i I feel like it needs to be season one so that when she comes back in season two she's like okay i'm a new person we're changing (laughs) things up and halbrand is just so smug and i like him so much and that is just a huge red flag for me i'm sorry he's (laughs) he's charming and personable and i want him to be the good guy but oh there's just something there's something that tells me he's not He's not who he says he is. Yeah. Uh, and we were talking earlier about how to make Galadriel potentially a more interesting character. Her kind of having this extremely firm belief that is then shattered. Yeah. Um, yeah. That would create some character development, presumably. So I hope so. I am, I'm much more leaning into the perhaps Halbrand is not who we all think he is camp at this point so all right uh, that is my formal apology for <laughs> for being so dismissive last week my, my feelings that were said, not hurt last week that said if i do turn out to be right and he is just the king of the south i will totally gloat about it when that reveal occurs okay fair totally okay. fair so muriel says she's not going to help with this battle in the southlands mm-hmm. And Galadriel's like, uh, I need to speak. <laughs> Galadriel does her best Karen impression and is like, oh, I need to yeah. speak with the manager, yep. uh, which is Muriel's father. And Muriel gets so pissed at that that uh, she throws her into jail, uh, where she kind of talks with uh, with Halbrand. By the way, I thought uh, Muriel, kind of summing up my own thoughts on Galadriel's plotline this episode, when she says, you know, I welcome you as a guest and you gallop off to our countryside to steal ancient scrolls while your Southland companion assaults our citizenry. End quote. Yeah. Which is like, wow, yeah, she uh, 
It's kind She's of right. Galadriel really hasn't been. Uh, they, they really haven't availed themselves. They haven't clothed themselves in glory since coming to Numenor. No, no, they're not doing any favors to uh, help uh, make amends with that elf uh, human relationship right now, are they? <laughs> I don't not think even so. a little bit. So uh, she goes to jail. Halbrand talks to her. Is like you need to. She says. He says to her. You know. You need to cool it a little bit and like take it easy and learn to use some diplomacy here. Um, so anyway, before any more conversation can happen, Farazon comes in with some men. It's like, we're going to take you back to, uh, the, your, your home under mm-hmm. armed escort. She, <laughs> there's a mini action scene, I guess, where she kind of shoves all these dudes into the jail cell. You like this scene, right? I, I think this is a, this is an okay action scene. I think, <sighs> I would have liked to see a little bit more of like in the same way that we can see Arundir do all of these amazing stunts. I want to watch Morvith Clark do just like an amazing acrobatics thing. Like I riding the horse was great. I thought that was fun, but like, I want to see why the elves are just so much better equipped to handle humans. And I think by cutting away to not seeing how she throws all four of these very armed guards into this jail cell and shuts the door, uh, cheapened that a little bit um to me it felt like they ran out of money on the shoot they're like yeah. <laughs> hey we could have an intricate choreographed action scene or we'll just show her shoving it into the cell and like that's gonna be it no one's gonna ask any questions about that so it's like yeah. okay uh, it's fine you, you know the the show spends lots of money in other places I'm oh sure yeah we're gonna see a badass galadriel action scene at some point I but really it was kind of so. si- it was a little bit silly in terms mm-hmm. of its execution i thought yeah uh she, galadriel storms up into the castle to see the king right Mm -hmm. realizes that the king is actually in bad shape and Muriel probably had good reasons for not uh, taking her to see him. Yeah. Muriel kind of lays out the whole history of their people, which is basically like the king was really into elf human alliances, Mm -hmm. um, but people didn't like it. um, Mm -hmm. And essentially when she took over, she's like, okay, the elf human relationships are over. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a pretty reductive job of explaining it so do you want to give some more color to that yeah i can i can give a little bit more backstory so obviously this goes into more detail in like books like the silmarillion and we get a little bit more of a uh a a nuance we keep using this word um but it is a little bit more nuanced so the way this works is there's a bit of a confusing detail but the king is um basically the first king of um numenor was Elrond's brother, Elros, who we learned last uh, week, was friendly to the elves and they had good relationships. And then over time, you know, they got distant and, you know, some of that sentiment started to grow grow sour. Muriel's father in the books was one of the first kings in a while, I think, to be a like a a friend to the elves um, or or at least be non-hostile to them. Um, And sometimes when you're trying to push an agenda the agenda doesn't always work and people push the opposite and so muriel's father was basically a victim of his own hubris and trying to be a uh a you know uh you know those bright-eyed and bushy-tailed politicians that are like i alone am going to change the world and then they get in there and they realize like oh there's a system in place specifically designed to stop me from doing what i want to keep the people in power that's basically kind of how i read into this like yes he's the king but everybody else is like "Mm, no numenor first numenor first make numenor great again i think oh no oh god i (laughs) Is what I everyone that, is feeling. I hate that you're right, but yeah, that's basically <laughs> it in like the worst possible way, though. So then Muriel comes to power and she's like, well, the people don't want the elf human relationships. And so we're just going to have to keep things the way they are. Yeah. Right. Um, so then Muriel takes Galadriel to see this object called the Palantir, which is like mm-hmm. a seeing stone. Yes. I guess so right? these, we actually see uh, one of these in the Lord of the Rings movies. This is the thing that Saruman the white Christopher Lee's mm. character. He's holding his hand over and talking to uh, Sauron. This is how they communicate. So there were originally seven of these seeing stones. They were made by, here's a little bit of a callback. They were made by Feanor, that elf, that we mentioned in episode two who made the hammer uh, that was like the most powerful elf and is responsible for most of the death in the world um, because of that war. 
in the first stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's his fault. I won't won't get too into the weeds here. But yeah, Feanor made the Palantir as a means of communication. And the Palantir have a way of providing vision, whether that's the future, the past, what is currently happening to where things are. And um, the, the way that Galadriel sort of approaches it and touches it is sort of giving her that same sort of you know, dream sequence. And I quite like that. I thought that was really well done. Yet another notch in the sort of fast and loose magic style that Tolkien runs with, where he doesn't really follow a set of rules. It's just kind of convenient for him to have them exist. And yeah, they're cool. But like, how do they work? Elf magic, I think. (laughs) Well, my favorite part of the episode with Galadriel, at least, is when she's like, hey, if you touch the Palantir, you know, crazy stuff's going to happen. And mm-hmm. Galadriel's like, I've touched the Palantir before, okay? Oh, like, yeah. You don't, need to, <laughs> yeah. Touched, you don't need to go over what a Palantir is, okay? I know what it is. It's not my first uh, rodeo. It's not yeah, my no. first Palantir rodeo. Uh, yeah. I, I kind of love that moment. But she's like, you haven't touched this one. Uh, and in fact, yeah. Galadriel does, is, feels quite disquieted by what actually occurs, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So she touches the Palantir. She sees kind of the wave thing happen from the fir- first scene of the episode. Uh, it's also, I think, uh, one of the shots in this sequence is basically used in some of the key art with, you know, the the leaves, uh, yes. the flowers kind of blowing uh, at her from the tower. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's mm-hmm. a very lovely shot. And then she realizes, wow, uh, Numenor I- is in for a bad time. And I guess their interpretation is that um, if they do what Galadriel says, like that the prophecy of this flooding will come true? Is that is so- that kind of... Yeah. No, so I think I think they're kind of going for a um a little bit of a you have a decision to make as an island of Numenor, and if you make the wrong decision, uh it's gonna be you know bad times for you I, and, and the flood yeah, will come, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and the idea is that like, hey, here's a elf coming in and telling us to do this big bold thing mm-hmm. that seems extremely risky and for which there is very little chance of success. And uh, maybe if we listen to her, uh, this terrible thing will befall us, kind of, right? Potentially, yeah. 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 But then they put her on the ship. She starts leaving, and that's when the leaves start blowing in. Now, yeah. the leaves are, or the flowers are interpreted to be the tears of the Valar. Mm. Please remind us, Don Marshall, who are the Valar? Right. So the Valar are the, the – they call them the gods in – uh, the sh- the show I refer to them as the lesser gods because there's technically one god, but these are basically like the beings within the physical world that are the top notch, the top dog. They literally shaped the world at the beginning of time, and the elves know they exist, and they fought alongside them, and so did a bunch of humans, and they basically gave the humans these Numenorians. This island, basically Tolkien's version of Atlantis, as a gift to say, hey, thanks. And I loved this scene with the flowers because it is so emblematic of uh, capturing the spirit of Tolkien. There's a great part in the Return of the King book where Aragorn is looking for a sign. Um, to, you know, realize that he needs to become king and that this is his right moment. And he finds a, um, a, a blooming, uh, f- a flower or, or a tree. I don't remember the specific details, but he finds it in nature as he is sort of exploring. And so the idea of like nature and the world around you giving you signs that you are on the right path or on the wrong path is very emblematic of Tolkien throughout pretty much everything he ever wrote. So I thought this was really well done. I thought the music in this scene was absolutely brilliant too. Bear McCreary knocked it out of the park here. It's a beautiful sequence. And the idea is that they interpret sending her off as the thing that might cause the pain. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so then they're like, okay, then they do a 180. They're like, okay, we got to, Galadriel's yeah. right. We got to recruit people. Mm-hmm. And they start recruiting people to sail off and help to defeat the evil in the Southlands, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Is kind of what they're doing. Yeah. And, now, and just, it, sorry, real quick, if I may just give a quick detail. Um, for those that maybe aren't as familiar with first age mythology, I won't give you too many, uh, I won't go too deep into it, but suffice to say, if you feel like uh, the gods getting involved through like nature symbols, this has happened many times. The Valar get involved uh, a lot in the first age, and the second age is sort of their way to say, uh, "All right, we're not going to get as involved, but like 
we're going to at least try and point you in the right direction. A couple of other details to point out. One is that uh, you had clocked that Halbrand was apparently let go, probably by Farazon, for yes. helping Farazon uh, figure out what Galadriel's plan was, right? Yeah, yeah. He is seen freely, like at the uh, towards the end of the episode. Uh, yeah, they are. They're Jill doing. Early. They're doing the the like, who will join me on this on this trip? And uh, it's like, I will serve. I will serve. There's a, a quick shot of Halbrand standing on a bridge, uh, walking freely. I took that to mean that when Halbrand was still in jail, he told Farazon where to find Galadriel because obviously he knew where she was going, and so Farazon is like. Mm, I don't know if I trust you. And I assume, I kind of wish we had seen this, but I assume Hal Brand is like, if you let me go, I'll tell you where she's going. Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of what I, I think, I feel like we might see that a little bit later. And like, maybe Hal Brand gets in with Farazon a little bit, but we'll see. We'll see. Or maybe it's a statement on the fact that people can, uh, you know, be recruited for military action, even if they're in jail in New York, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, they're very maybe they're a very militaristic society that we're not yet familiar with. So, I one think of, we might see that. I have a feeling of, we might see that. One of the other people that volunteers is Isildur. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got a little bit more of his plotline today. I, I thought the Isildur stuff was, I have to say, kind of silly this episode. Um, yeah, w- what I mean is, you he's trying to try out for the Sea Guard, and he's on the ship, and then these islands. My understanding is they're to the west are calling to him. This is this is something that I hope we get a little bit uh, explained a little bit more. I don't necessarily know where they're going with this, even through, you know, all of the lore that I have in my head. Um, but it's, if I'm remembering correctly, I think Numenor is just one big island. So it almost seems as though he is staring off into another part of the island. I don't know what that has in store for Isildur, but yeah, I'm I'm kind of with you on this one. Isildur's plotline is maybe the least interesting to me, at least for right now. Um, but I hope, at the very least, they are sort of setting him up to play a much larger role. Because also keep in mind, right? He's he's younger at this point. His dad is the sort of maybe more important one right now, and we will maybe see him grow through these hopefully five seasons of the show. So. We see Isildur taking his final exam for the Sea Guard, this thing that we didn't even know he was doing until last episode, I think, right? And then uh, he basically throws the exam by not doing a very critical thing. And then the guy's like, you're out of the Sea Guard. And not only that, your buddies are out of the Sea Guard too. And it's like, whoa, okay. Didn't even know that that was a thing. And I guess it's really harsh if you mess up one thing. The guy even says to him, you've done it correctly every single time I've seen you do it. But because you messed up this one time, you're out of the Sea Guard. Why did they throw out his friends? Probably just so Isildur has friends to hang out with for whatever his adventure is next, is my guess. That right? felt a little convenient <laughs> to the plot. Yeah, yeah. I, I honestly, I think it would have been meant a little even more if the friends didn't get kicked out and decided to go anyway, right? Because mm. we got them in episode two saying like, I can't wait to do this. This is going to be so great. Five years and we'll be, or however long it takes, and we'll have our own our own ship. And then like to basically say, no, 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 I'm going to give all that up and I'm going to go fight because my friend is needing me. I feel like that might give the friends a little bit more agency, but you know. I just think it's pretty rough storytelling to introduce a thing like last episode that we didn't even know about. It's like he he's trying to be in the Sea Guard, but he kind of maybe doesn't really, his heart's really not in it. And then all of a sudden he's out of the Sea Guard. And it's like, well, what was the point of introducing the Sea Guard plotline at all? Like, yeah, it's it's a little you know, could, disjointed for could me. Could we have too. just started with Isildur? I guess, I guess the idea is that he had he had lost something, and then you know, and, and then he's like going on this journey to kind of make up for it in some ways, or finding new renewed purpose in life because of it. But yeah, it does feel a little bit odd. Uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, a bit out of place. Uh, a, a bit, a bit too like paint by numbers of like, oh, he needs to lose something before he goes on the big journey. So we're going to have him lose the sea guard thing that we're barely going to introduce. But anyway, uh, not a problem. Not a huge problem. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm indifferent right now. So that's the Numenor stuff. Yeah. Before we get to the rest of the episode, let's talk about the Southland stuff real quick. The Southland stuff seems to be pretty isolated from the rest of the plot. Um, it seems to be like yes. on, on its own right now, right? A- and David, I don't know if, if I want to get too deep into this with you. Have you been looking online at any number of theories about the Southlands plotline? No. Okay. No. 
this I is a pote- this is a potential theory that I have seen floated around a few times. Those of you that follow me, let me, me guess what t- the theory is before you even go say for what it. it is. Go for I it. I have not seen any theories. I'm just guessing. Okay. Okay. Go for that it. That the Southlands plot is taking place during a different time frame than everything else in the show. That's absolutely correct. Yes, <laughs> that's something that happened in Westworld, which is another yes. Yes, TV yes. show that this um, not only has happened, has happened multiple times in Westworld. <laughs> it's just another television show that uh, Decoding TV has covered in the past. So. Um, I've seen it all, Don Marshall. You yeah. can't surprise me anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> but okay, so some people speculate the, South, the Southland stuff might be taking place during a different time frame. Yes. What say you, Don Marshall? I, I liked the idea. I don't necessarily know if it is true, but I think think it would make for an incredible reveal with like the Galadriel plot line converging with the Arundir plot line or the Theo plot line in that um I like Theo and I've had the pleasure of meeting Tyro Mohafedin twice he's a great dude um but I think if like if Theo gets a scar in the next few episodes that's like the one you see on his arm in this one um and we see that but it's on the arms of like an old man or like this angry person. I think we are, I think we are operating in multiple timelines. I think that would be a pretty cool twist because would, is Theo Morgoth or Sauron or no, what do you- <laughs> no, no, I, I think <laughs> so. Morgoth is currently in what's called the void. It's basically uh-huh. like the jail for gods. Uh, I, I don't <laughs> think he's going to be a factor at all unless they go completely off the rails with the lore. Uh-huh. Um, could he be Sauron? Uh, potentially um my guess is probably that he uh and again this is a theory so if you don't want me to spoil something uh maybe skip ahead 30 seconds i think theo is uh probably one of the nazgul and i think he is going to get recruited by adar or corrupted by adar and we will see uh when galadriel gets to the southlands that he is Mm. a much older guy and we'll see older theo later on yeah we may see older three theo which kind of works with the timeline because arundir would still be alive and potentially like some sort of like ranger fighting against him or maybe they have him captive somewhere i don't know the the possibilities are endless but i am i think leaning more towards the multiple timelines theory interesting interesting why any reason why like are are there things in the plot line that give you a sense that it might be it's so disjointed right now (laughs) that i don't like like think about it like this right we've watched arundir get captured by these orcs who are hiding in a tunnel right and there's you know sulfur pits and this thing that they're like they're looking for something but like it doesn't strike me as like the southlands are in like danger danger from an occupying army it's just like we haven't really seen the full might of the orcs right and to me i don't really feel all that threatened by you know oh god the orcs are invading it's just like if the numenorians come in with a big enough army you can wipe them out i haven't seen the army of the orcs and so to me i want to be able to be like oh man now they're screwed because they've had all of that time to grow. And what we've been watching was just the start. And now that we've seen it start to grow, we're like, oh, shoot, Galadriel and Halbrand and whoever goes with them are screwed. Interesting. Okay. Uh, well, I, I suspect we're going to find out pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's always exciting when you're watching a show like this and like two of the plot lines converge, you know, because... Mm-hmm. So, Galadriel is heading to the Southlands with Numenor fighters, probably, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. my guess is the next two weeks, we're going to f- find out what happens. And and this is where I think we're going to get well, a little watch bit Watch next of- episode be 100% Harfoot, and we don't find out anything about it. <laughs> your, fa- no. your favorite, Don. That'll be your favorite. Uh, listen, listen. I love <laughs> I love the cottagecore vibes of the, of the Harfoots. Um but but they they are a little bit more disconnected. Like heck, we might just find out that the Harfoot plotline isn't even related to anything having to do with it. And they just <laughs> the Harfoots like... took place in the first age. Maybe. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, well, it's an interesting theory, and I wouldn't put it past the show. And uh, and the, you know, it would account for the fact that this plotline seems completely disconnected from the mm-hmm. other plotlines, right? Mm-hmm. Right. There was this thing earlier in the episode where. Uh, in episode one, where Aaron Dio is kind of called back home, right? He's supposed to leave, mm-hmm. right? And I was like, is that related to anything that's going on with Gladriel right now? Because uh, I, I, I had thought maybe he's supposposed to go to Valinor too, you know, but I don't know. Here's, I don't, here's my you know, thought, yeah. right? Yeah. Here's my thought. 
Let's say Gil Galad says the war is over, sends word to the Watchtowers the war is over, right? Yeah. All yeah, of the yeah. elves try and go home. Yeah. Well, let's say that if this Southlands plot is taking place in the past, that gives a little bit more credence to the idea of Galadriel. All of that stuff happened ages ago. Gil Galad brought in everybody from the Watchtowers years ago. There's nothing out there anymore. Well, wouldn't you know it? All of a sudden, it's like, oh, the Watchtower stuff in the Southlands was happening. There was a threat out there, and Gil Galad was wrong to bring everybody back because the threat was just right there. So we'll see. All right, we'll see. I mean, how silly are you going to feel if you know they if Galadriel meets young Theo next week, and it's like clearly on the same timeline? A little silly. I won't lie. I won't lie. I will. I will be just a, just a little bit disappointed. Yeah, yeah. So there is one shot that I think is an Easter egg for now, but may play a little bit more of a role. There is a shot of Galadriel looking at a sword, and she kind of glances at it, and I think recognizes it. I believe this sword that she looks at when she's sort of in this room with Muriel and uh, her father is Narsil, the sword that we see reforged in the Third Age. Um, there is also potentially a shield that is an Easter egg from the first age. I won't get too much into it because that's a book only thing. Uh, but yeah, I think there's there's a Narsil that we may see later on. Aaron Deer, he, at the end of last episode, he was like being brought to Adar. Mm-hmm. The orcs are like, we got to bring you to Adar. Mm-hmm. So they bring him to Adar and they make him watch this uh, death ceremony that Adar does on one of the other orcs, right? Mm-hmm. The orcs is like not, not in good shape. And then Adar uh, kills him. Mm-hmm. You know, Mercy kills him. Yeah. And then Adar and Arendir speak. And I was genuinely shocked, Don Marshall, uh, that Adar was an elf. Yeah. Uh, I did that, not see that coming. Did that coming? threw me for a little bit. And I, I don't know if anybody else feels this way. I was really surprised because I, I actually kind of think it looked like Galadriel's brother a little bit. It was maybe it was oh, the cheekbones yeah. and the elf. I'm like, you're saying the bring... blurry picture from last episode, right? The the blurry picture. And then when you when you sort of transition, I was like, wait, is that Galadriel's? Bro- oh, OK, so it's definitely a different actor. But I'm like, did they bring Galadriel's brother back from the dead? And like he's because elves can reincarnate when they die. They go to, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like a, like a, a purgatory place and then they can be. Uh, not necessarily reincarnated, but they can come back. Um, and I was like, that's not Galadriel's brother, is it? And it it wasn't as far as I'm aware, right? He, he still goes by Adar, but they are um, they are speaking in the subtitles in an Elvish uh, language called Quenya, which is almost all spoken in the Undying Lands, the place we saw in the prologue that was basically paradise. Most of the elves that are here in Middle Earth uh, speak an elvish called Sindarin. And I thought it was very interesting that they pointed out that he is speaking in Quenya, because that leads me to believe that he was probably an elf from the Undying Lands that came over during the war. That we, uh, that we, you know, maybe we got a quick shot of him and we just missed it or what. But yeah, this definitely feels like uh, some sort of corrupted uh, elf servant of Sauron almost right now did they po- when you say they pointed out that they're speaking in Quenya I saw that in the subtitles did they also say it out loud no they didn't they said it they said in Qu- they literally yeah, I believe it, the words Quenya or in Quenya it's oh, in the subtitles mm, fascinating yeah well it's awesome to see Joseph Maul who plays uh Adar in Lord of the Rings Rings of Power he also played mm-hmm. Uncle Benjamin. In yep. Game of Thrones. Yep, same uh, dude. Beloved character in that show. So, and Adar communicates to Arendir, uh, "Hey, you got to go back and tell these people to surrender their claim to their lands and serve me." I guess, right? Is, is it, who, it, it was basically at? like a "You need to leave, or we're going to enslave you." Yeah. Um, and there is this great line where he says, you know, I'm not a god yet, basically. He's got this guy's got some confidence. Yeah. He's got this thing under control. Yeah. I thought the performance of Adar was really amazing. It yeah, just, I was think he did pretty a great chilling. Job. Because especially because up until now, we've only seen elves be in a certain aesthetic, right? Mm-hmm. They're all like noble, badasses, fighting for the forces of good. And then to mm-hmm. see one that's kind of like orc like. Mm-hmm. Uh, is really unsettling. 
And so, so I really loved, yeah, go ahead. I have another theory about potentially who Adar may be. Mm-hmm. So in the Silmarillion, and I don't know how much they can sort of use, uh, the showrunners that is, how much they can use as far as like this kind of content. But yeah. in the Silmarillion, the orcs are corrupted elves. They are kidnapped. They are, you know, uh, basically dark magic infused with dark magic and and kind of almost like brutalized to the point of like their mind breaking. It would not surprise me if like Adar is one of the first orcs or like the leader of the orcs and they're they're coming for um you know they're they're looking for these these uh, the sword and this is like the first sword that they used or or like a morgul blade for the nazgul but yeah this definitely strikes me as like he's someone i just don't know who yet i don't think he's sauron though mm-hmm. so what else is going on at the same time is we saw Bronwyn and Theo leave with all their people last episode. Uh, they take shelter in this watchtower. They don't have any supplies. Uh, Bronwyn is like, let's go and scavenge for food. Theo's like, no, we got to go back to the town that we were in, get the food from there because we have tons of supplies. And Bronwyn's like, it's overrun run with orcs though. So then Bro- like Theo goes with his friend uh, to scavenge, encounters orcs, almost dies intersects with Arendir who comes in and saves his ass and then they flee to the woods Bronwyn shows up somehow <laughs> she's there I, as well I don't <laughs> she know why looking she's there. for him uh she sensed that uh it's a, it's a mater- was close. yeah it's a maternal <laughs> instinct you you get that kind of GPS when you become a mother I think I was gonna say I was gonna say it was more of an Arendir connection but you know whatever oh. either way <laughs> yeah, I like the uh, sun <laughs> I liked, uh, you know, it's, it's some nice, beautiful, classic Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson-esque filmmaking of, you know, the elf catches the arrow and then turns it around and uses it against it. Oh, so I, I'm cool. a sucker for that stuff. I'm a sucker. Oh, for no, that, that was stuff, great. You know? That was so yeah. great. I think that whole sequence from the long take with Theo, uh, I don't know if anybody's played Shadow of Mordor or Shadow of War. It's like a mm. stealth video game um, where you basically play a ranger and sneak through a bunch of brush and undercover. That made me feel, this scene made me feel like I was like back in that game hiding from orcs trying to run away um and i love that sequence the slow motion um arrow firing and just the action sequence was amazing and then the the wide shot with the sun and arndir and bronwyn kind of just standing there when he's holding the sword is like quintessential tolkien only to immediately cut to one of my biggest shocks of the the episode, we find out that it's actually Disa singing in in Moria. And we'll get to that plot line in a minute, but I just thought that was a very brilliant sequence and very felt very Peter Jackson Tolkien-esque to me. I thought that was very well done. Yeah. We closed the episode with uh Aaron Deer having gotten everyone to safety, Theo talks with an old man. Theo is a hero because he was able to get these important supplies. Mm-hmm. And he talks to this old man who knows about Theo having the blade because I think the old man had the blade and like yes, Theo the, was, yeah, 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 took it from him and basically says you need to get ready. That stranger coming in in the meteor that's a sign about the things that are going to come. Whether or not he's right about that, I, I don't think we know. We'll see. Um, I think it's an interesting idea, Don, because in general, in most of fantasy and science fiction, a lot of prophecies are about good things that are going to happen. Right? Mm-hmm. You're the one. You are the prince that was promised. You are the blah, 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 blah. This is like, seems to be a prophecy about an evil thing that's going to come and happen. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you need to be ready for the evil thing because you might be one of his soldiers or whatever it is going to be. Um, but it's a nice, creepy way to end that kind of plot line. I didn't know yeah. if you had any other thoughts. Um, yeah, no, not too many thoughts on that one. I thought it was kind of a nice wrap up because I didn't know whose sword it was. And I'm glad that they introduced, you know, uh, dissension in the ranks with that guy being like, yeah, no, we, we got to lean into this Sauron thing. He's going to give us power. So I feel like we're going to get maybe get some betrayal uh, if uh, Adar decides to attack this tower at any point and you know maybe they'll be saved by galadriel and, and company or or maybe r and will defeat him in combat and i don't know we'll we'll see all right don before we move on to the final plot lines of this episode let's talk a little bit about where people can find more of your work on the internet this week yes hello my name is don i go by don marshall 72 on all social medias i'm on tiktok which is my main platform i also stream live on twitch uh, we do watch parties for the rings of power every sunday at 
1 p.m. Eastern. I also have a YouTube channel, a Twitter, an Instagram, all that stuff. Uh, and I very recently just launched a completely revamped Patreon, uh, which gets you a whole bunch of bonus stuff. Um, and it is only $2. However, because we are on this podcast, I must say, please subscribe to the podcast first because there is some amazing content coming out of this. I oh, have had the well, pleasure of listening to most of it, David. You do a remarkable job. Oh, thanks so much. But yes, definitely. Uh, if you have grown to love Middle Earth and want to do a deep dive, Don Marshall is one of the best resources out there. So check out all this stuff. We'll link to a bunch of it in the show notes. All right, Don Marshall, let's talk about Elrond this episode. We got to see Elrond and Durin and Celebrimbor again. So first of all, major shock to me, Don, oh. which is you see Elrond and Celebrimbor again this episode, and they're working to build the forge. It looks as though months have passed mm -hmm. since the mm -hmm. last episode where you saw this. Yeah. Am I, am I right about it? Like, are elves just really fast builders or have months passed on? So, so the way I'm interpreting this at yeah. is they're kind of playing a little fast and loose with the timelines here, which is why I was on the multiple timelines thing before the break. But this uh, strikes me as, yeah, They've been building uh, for a while, and it's kind of almost like its own separate thing. Here's why I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Um, because it is going to, just from a geological standpoint, take Galadriel and all of those people, if they are going to the Southlands, it's going to take them a very long time. It's going to take a while for the army to get there. They can, through the power of television, just show up there eventually, but it's going to take time. So I think what we are seeing is a little bit of a, a, a difference in the timeline. So like, yeah, it's probably been a few weeks or months. Um, yeah, dwarves do work that fast, but maybe not that fast because uh, Galadriel's been there for maybe like three days, I yeah. think. Um but, yeah, but I think I, what is clear is probably that the show is structuring the timeline so that um, when the characters intersect, right, it, it's obviously, it's all building to some of these characters meeting each other. Right? Yes. And when yes. they meet each other, it will obviously be at the same time. They'll mm -hmm. be at the same point in their timelines. But that um, that the stuff that we're seeing on a per episode basis might not be taking place at the same time. Yes, I think that is 100% the case because I was a little bit shocked too. I'm like, oh, Elrond's back with with Cele, uh, Celebrimbor. That's cool. Yeah. I I really I really appreciated Charles Edwards's uh, performance in episode two, and I think he he brings it home again in in episode three. He's this sort of like uh, almost absent minded delusions of grandeur kind of elf that very much wants to uh, sort of come out from under his his family uh, name and make a name for himself. Cal Brimble also gives this nice story talking about Elrond's dad and his memory of him. Mm -hmm. it was a nice, nice character moment. Uh, yeah. I, I'm loving the Elrond character moments in general, you know? Yeah. I think they're nice. Um, so Elrond goes to visit Durin because he wants to find out where Durin is. What do you remember what the what the motivation was for that again? Like why so did he, I I yeah. think it was something along the lines of Durin's not uh, uh interacting with Celebrimbor. Uh, oh, at yeah, all, right. and there are more things that Celebrimbor sort of needs, and to do yeah. that, you need, you know, you need to sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Hey, can you help me out here? Uh, but it, it uh, I got the sense that Durin was avoiding Celebrimbor and is either, you know, went back to Moria or never showed up uh, to Eregion in the first place. So Elrond goes back. Uh, I don't necessarily know if we needed the scene with Celebrimbor, um, but I think they wanted to show that there was progress happening um, because of, again, this is just a theory, the whole accelerated, condensed, multiple yeah. timelines thing. Yes. Uh, you know, Don, you were doubtful that we might, I, I mean, we had questioned whether we might see this forge completed in uh, this season, but I think it's uh, making good progress. I, I would be I, shocked I if so. it wasn't completed by the end of the season. I, I think we are, yeah, I think we are going to see that <laughs> sort of come to fruition uh, at the beginning, or rather at the end of this season, and then the beginning of next season, maybe there's a time skip or something, uh, but we will see the, the real Forge uh, light up. Elrond goes to visit Durin. Durin's not home. Disa's home. Uh, they have basically a duel of lies. <laughs> Uh, not really. I mean, well, I mean, it's El just a bunch Elrond's of not, it's Elrond's just a bunch of people lying. in the no, no, but it's just a bunch of people in the room sitting around and talking like Game of Thrones. Exactly, but she, you know, he's like, "Why isn't Durin here?" And she's like, "Well, 
um, he's off at the blah. And then he says, well, if he's really there, then wouldn't this be true? And wouldn't this be true? And would this be true? And she's like, well, here's explanations for every single one of those things. Back off, Elrond. <laughs> but of course, Disa is lying about all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. The real fact of the matter is that Durin is digging for what we later find out is Mithril, right? Yep. And the reason why he's concealing that fact is because he doesn't want his dad to know about it because it's dangerous to do this. So love seeing Disa again. They they have a great chemistry. She has great chemistry with all the other characters. Oh, she's uh, I, in, I think Sophia the- does an amazing job as Disa. That is that is just one of the the highlights of each episode. I love seeing her on on screen. What did you think of this whole plot line? For me, a little bit weird to see the Mithril reveal. Like, why does Elrond know what Mithril is called? That was what was weird to me. Okay, you know? so yeah, yeah no, me. I can I can explain that a little bit because this did confuse a couple of people in my comment section. So Durin says that they are calling it Gray Glitter. Mm-hmm. However, um, he says it in the the common tongue in English, basically. Um, but he doesn't give the Dwarvish word for it because the Dwarvish language is a secret. So. When Durin says, we call it gray glitter, he then translates it into Elvish, which was something like Mithrond. But Elrond corrects him saying, no, 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 the Elvish word for gray glitter is Mithril. So he doesn't actually like, he doesn't have all of the knowledge and the backstory of what it is. He's literally just translating the word that Durin uh, told him. I see. That that's what I thought, but it, it's not clear in the show, and the show kind of makes it into a very almost like prequel lightus moment where it's like it's called Mithril, and it's mm-hmm, like okay, mm-hmm. okay, I don't know why it's weird that he would know that, but that's a good explanation, and uh, I I knew you'd have an answer for me about that. So uh, there's a massive collapse at the mine, and uh, four of Durin's men are trapped, and they uh, Disa performs a beautiful song. Uh, a plea to the rocks to release the bodies within the mines and with breath amazing. still. Yeah, it, it is with breath still inside them. I think was yes. the, was the uh, thing that hit home for me. It's like, Oh, you are quite literally asking your God to like move mountains. And I mean that in like the literal sense, because the, the God that created the dwarves, Aule, this is one of the Valar, like we were talking about before. Aule is like, the father to all dwarves and created mm. all of them. And so when they're, when they're singing to him and we see that very cool moment of, of resonance where the singing actually moves uh, the silt and the stone that is, as it shakes, I thought that was a brilliantly done scene. I thought that was really, really well done. It was really cool. And also the idea of this reverence to the mountain, I think is really lovely, yeah. lovingly rendered in the show. Um, earlier on, I think he like makes Elrond swear to the, to the mountain, right? Yep. And yep. The, the, the reverence for the mountain is like really, um, it's cool to see. It's not something you see in a normal TV show, you know? So no. And this is, again, this is very much Tolkien, right? The dwarven aspect of nature is very different than the elven. Doran makes him swear on the mountain itself. And then Elrond is like, all right, I will put my hand on this stone, but I will also bring my own culture into this. I swear on the memory of my father, a Yeah. Fortunately, they're, they're pulled out alive and, uh, Durin is really not happy about needing to talk with his dad about it. Uh, but, uh, Elrond gives him this talk about how, Hey, even getting yelled at by your dad is a blessing. Yeah. Which I thought was a nice chat is a nice, idea you know the idea that like even if your parent is i I guess unless it's like really toxic and like a painful relationship but like even if your parent is disciplining you or is disappointed in you it's still a way of your parent connecting with you you know i thought that was like a powerful idea there was there was one line uh it's it's duran says something like sometimes i wish i could tell him exactly what i think of him and then elrond gives this amazing lore drop for you know anyone that's read the silmarillion is like oh Oh, they're using the backstory in, of Elrond's because Elrond is a, such a tragic character. He's, you know, his father is is held as like one of the greatest of all time. His mother as well. His brother, he has already lost his brother because his brother chose to be human, and like Numenor is his brother's legacy. Meanwhile, here's Elrond just like trying to do something with himself. And I wrote down the line because I thought it was it was so great. I would be only too happy to hear any judgment. So long as it was grant, it granted me the opportunity to have but one more conversation with my father. Do not waste what time you have. 
left with yours. That hit home. Like I think for me and for a lot of people just, and you know, we're bringing our own emotional baggage into it, but it was, it was really well-crafted. I think Robert Jaramillo did a fantastic job in that. Agreed. There is a recounting of how Elrond and Durin met. Uh, Elrond says he saved Durin from three trolls. Do you know how Elrond and Durin met from the books? No, I, I don't, unfortunately. No, I <laughs> I am glad that we have that sort of moment of levity after what is a, a very serious uh, sort of heartfelt moment. Deza comes in to sort of lighten the mood. And I, I love that kind of dynamic because it feels very much like the Legolas and Gimli friendship when they're like, jiving back and forth and like gribbing each other and just i i think that relationship to me is one of the the uh the ones that have the best chemistry in the show Mm -hmm. finally duran has a conversation with his dad Mm. asks for forgiveness his dad says there's nothing to forgive i thought this played out a little bit too cleanly i think there's probably a lot of subtext here that i just wasn't getting you know the idea that um like, why does his dad say there's nothing to forget? I don't really understand, you know? Um, yeah. I don't really sense that we know w- w- the full extent of his dad's anger, right? Because I think, wasn't the last time we saw them when they were opening the case of Mithril, and then now this time he's like already digging for it, right? Is that, was there yeah, anything in so between that? I think the implication was that they have been digging for this in secret for a while. Durin, his dad, Durin the third, probably shut it down the first yeah. time. And so they're now doing it the second time in secret. But it's that part was a little bit unclear. Um, but I think well, well, the big question, the big question, Don, is uh, and I'm hoping I'm hoping you can help with this is Durin, when he's talking about the Mithril, is saying how this will be like an important uh, object that could or an important resource that could revitalize their homeland, right? Mm-hmm. Casa mm-hmm. Doom, Moria, like the, the whole area. But to me, I was unclear, like, is is the homeland in, in trouble in any way? Because it seems like it's thriving, right? And, and that's what I think would, is a little confusing is this whole set of actions between Durin and his dad would make more sense to me if I understood the full extent of what was going on in in the mountain and, and yeah. why it was troubled. Do you know what I'm saying? I, like, I think I think we they haven't explained as much what that is. I sort of see it as you know they need it. It almost feels right now, and maybe they'll flesh this out a bit more as like a means to an end. Because I don't see the mountain being in trouble. I don't see the dwarves you know struggling to build anything. But to but, me, but it's, in the books, is that the case though? Like in I, the books, is it on the, is cause a doom on the decline in the book as, I guess, as far as i'm aware and i again i am not like sort of the the dwarven expert in the lore when it comes to that sort of thing i don't believe the dwarves are facing any trouble like that um but i i feel like to me they're just kind of presenting it like uh this is like the next this is like the Wright brothers inventing you right. know or like the internet or, you know, the, yeah. <laughs> the, this sort of this, this next step in our, our culture that will shift. Cause like, remember if you've got a, a hundred thousand dwarves in mithril armor, nobody's stopping you. You can take down as many dragons as you want. Mm. You can conquer any mountain you want. And you'd basically be an unstoppable force. I guess I'm curious, like how are the dwarves thought of by the world at large at this time? You know, would that help dance? Um, you know, yeah. are they kind of like, seen as the underdogs or potentially uh, because their stature is not as high, like maybe people look down on them literally or metaphorically, or I'm Um, curious. I mean, uh, definitely literally because of the size difference, but metaphorically, I don't think second age wise, we haven't really gotten any indication that like the dwarves are like, we know that there's a rift between humans and elves in Numenor, right? I don't think we've gotten any indication from a TV show aspect of whether or not the dwarves are, hated or disliked or looked down upon in any way and as far as i'm aware no i don't think they are um but i would definitely like to see more of that culture explored yeah so in that case i think it's just a pretty confusing scene (laughs) (laughs) given all that you know and and of course if you know details about dwarves and how they were viewed during this time period let us know at decoding tv at (laughs) gmail.com but i trust dawn and uh if uh if the dwarves are held in high esteem, then uh, I don't know what's going on in this scene. Anyway, 
I guess Peter Mullen, who plays Duran's dad, mm-hmm. amazing actor, um, who also, also appeared in Westworld. Did he? Um, yeah, he was he was the guy in charge of Westworld, basically. Um, oh, so yeah, uh, amazing actor, and yeah, the idea is that hey, he forgives him, or there's nothing to forgive because he understands fundamentally what Duran was trying to do, which mm-hmm. is help their people out, right? Yeah, and maybe that's enough. Maybe that's enough as a character motivation. I personally, David Chen, I'm looking for a little bit more than that, but. <laughs> You want some nuance, you know? Yeah, I want some nuance. (laughs) A word we have not used in this podcast 18 times. (laughs) Any other thoughts on this episode? We should say that uh, Durin's dad sends Durin to go to Linden and like figure out what is happening, which I assume means like what's the forge being used for and why they're doing all this, et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, I think uh overall i think this was uh for me one of the stronger episodes um the numenor stuff is strong from a visual perspective i feel as though it's kind of the the midpoint like a means to an end where we have to get galadriel and company somewhere i'm i'm withholding judgment uh on it entirely until i see what happens with them in the southlands if they go and what happens in numenor either during the end of the season or potentially in later seasons. Um, I think the Moria Elrond plot line continues to be fairly strong for me. Yeah, I really I like so. what Robert Arameo is doing. Um, Disa continues to steal every scene that she's in. Um, and I think overall, this is uh, now that we are halfway through our eight episodes, season one, I desperately wish that this was 12 episodes. <laughs> And that season two could start in the next six months. Uh, But alas, uh, that is not the case. All right. Well, those are some thoughts on season one, episode four of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. I want to say, if you're listening to this right now, uh, we appreciate it. Thanks for uh, thanks for checking it out. We hope you've enjoyed the journey so far. We're halfway through. Can you believe it, Don Marshall? No, Amazing. no. I've spent four years yeah. hyping myself up for this, and now it's going to be over in a month? What the heck? <laughs> but thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoy the show, consider becoming a paid member at DecodingTV.com uh, or supporting Don Marshall on Patreon. Uh, until next week, we'll see you later. He is Don Marshall. I'm David Chen. And stay safe out there. Until the next episode of Lord of the Rings. Hey everyone, David Chen here. Thank you so much for watching that video from Decoding TV. If you want to get an audio version of the show, all you got to do is go to podcast.decodingtv.com. And if you want to support what we do, get ad-free episodes of the podcast and also bonus episodes of the podcast, go to decodingtv.com and become a paid member. Of course, you can also like and subscribe for more. We appreciate it. Thanks. See you later.